is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. So that's uh, our reading and thank you, Jeff, for bringing that to us. Sorry about the, the mix up with the sound. So the Trinity. Uh, it's a strange thing to celebrate in some ways because it's a doctrine of the church rather than an event, say, in the life of Jesus or like last week with Pentecost, the pouring out of God's spirit. And it's an interesting doctrine to choose because it's one that we find hard to get our minds around. It's, it's very mysterious. Uh, so there are some who would think, well, this is just fairly speculative or esoteric. Why, why do we have to bother ourselves with this? And I guess the reason that we do is that right from earliest, or the earliest days of the, uh, of the church, this is how the Christians experienced God. This was their experience of how God's love was revealed in their community in an ongoing way, how Jesus continued to be present with them uh, in their community, even though he was no longer physically present. And so this doctrine grew out of their experience, if you like, of God. And before we go any further, um, I'd just like us to all pause for a moment and think, if you were asked to describe God, very difficult thing to do, but if you were asked to describe God, what three or four words might you come up with to describe God? So I'm going to give you 30 seconds, so you can imagine there's some pleasant think music going on. Uh, and I've now unmuted everybody. Uh, so I'm just interested, what, what words come to your mind in, when you think of God and you have to yeah, describe what God might be like? My father. Uh -huh. Caring. Love. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Everywhere. Up the top. Embrace. Anyone else? There's, there's no wrong answers here. <laughs> <laughs> a loving father. Oh, I can't get my head down. All embracing. All embracing, yep. Anyway, I encourage you to keep thinking about that question, who is, who is God for you in your experience? Um, and the reason we have the Trinity is that for these early Christians who wrote our scriptures in the New Testament, this was their experience of God and that God was all of those words that we use, God was 
a loving father. God was caring. God was with them everywhere. And I guess they got to ref reflect on, well, who is God for us? God is like Jesus. We've seen Jesus. We've heard Jesus. We've seen what Jesus does. And God is like that. We've now experienced the Holy Spirit moving in and amongst our community. And God is like that as well. And so they came up with this doctrine to uh, reflect that experience. Now, the, uh, I guess, challenge for all Christians of every generation is to come up with um, relevant ways to describe God in our situation. And we might not choose this. We might not choose to describe God in this way as Father, Son, and Spirit. But that's how the early Christians did. And we see it in passages like the one we read from Matthew 28, where the baptism formula is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit which has carried on right through church history and right across every denomination of the church. Uh, we all use this baptism um, liturgy. And likewise, the grace, uh, which we often use at meetings uh, or when we pray, uh, you know, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. And that was being used within 20 years of, of Jesus' death. So it had become part of their ritual, part of their liturgy that they used each time they met. And as I've um, written in my reflection, I'm not going to read it all, but the Trinity is a way of thinking about God, but mostly it was a way of thinking about Jesus. And if you open up, ever things like the Apostles' Creed, which is used at a baptism when the whole congregation stands up and we confess our faith, if you like, and it's along the lines of we believe in God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But the longest paragraph by far is about Jesus. We believe in Jesus, and this is the Jesus we believe in. And then there's a third shorter paragraph about we also believe in the Holy Spirit and the church and the communion of saints and so forth. But in the creeds, in the basis of union of the Uniting Church, um, in our New Testament documents, the focus is really on trying to work out who is Jesus and how does Jesus relate to God and what does that indicate about God? So that's kind of like how this thinking developed. Being humans, uh, we find thinking about God challenging. And so we've come up with all sorts of analogies and images to help us think about God. And some of them are helpful and some of them are less helpful. And some of them I've given you on your notes. So there's a couple of pictures there that are often used. And the one uh, with a triangle and the, and the circles is, is trying to say, well, God is Father, Son and Spirit, um, but they're distinct from each other. But at the end of the day, I don't actually find that terribly helpful. Um, the one on the next to it in the green is called a Celtic knot. And you can trace your finger around that shape and never come to an end. Uh, and it's got the three, which is Trinity. Uh, I don't know if it was related to you know, that the shamrock symbol for Ireland, given that the Celtic Christianity came out of Ireland, it may have. Uh, and again, it's helpful in a way but it only takes us so far. People have come up with other analogies like water can be ice or steam, but it's all water, it's all H2O. 
or even an egg that is a yolk and a white and a shell, but it's still one egg. Or one that came earlier in church history is that of love. And this was due to Augustine who came up with this, that there is um, a lover, there is the beloved, and there is love itself or the mutual love shared between lover and beloved. And I don't know if you find any of these helpful or unhelpful, uh, but something to bear in mind is that they're all just analogies and they don't quite capture for us who God is and what God is really like, because God ultimately is a mystery. And if we could just draw a, a little symbol like that, then I doubt that, that would really reflect God. It also doesn't capture the personhood of God or the relationship that's going on within God. And that's why uh, some people like to view the Trinity more like a dance. And so right on the, the first page of this week's notes, there was this image, which is three figures kind of holding hands in a dance. And it's in the shape of a, a love heart as well. And it's trying to get across that, yes, there are three members of the Trinity who are in this kind of dance together. So there's movement, there's relationship, there's intimacy, uh, and it's about love. The other image that's on your notes this week is this one, which is a very famous icon from the Orthodox Church. Uh, originally done, drawn, written by uh, a man called Rublev, and you might have seen that before. That's taken from the story in Genesis 18, where three visitors come to uh, Abraham at his tent, and he offers them hospitality. And as the story goes on, it's a bit mysterious, like this whole notion of the Trinity. Are these people just three men? Are they three angels? Are they in fact God? Uh, because as that story goes on, God is talking to Abraham. And one of the things about this icon is that although these three have come to visit Abraham and he is offering them hospitality, the image suggests that these three are actually offering hospitality to Abraham. And there are symbols of the Eucharist there on the table that we are invited to join, in fact, uh, God's presence when we celebrate communion. So that's something of the the history and way of thinking about the Trinity. But what does it mean for us in practical terms? And I'm helped in this by thinking about different aspects of love. And we're told in the scriptures that God is love, that we're called to love one another, which reflects God's love in our community. Uh, elsewhere, we're told that the most important commandments are to love God and to love our neighbour. So I find it helpful to reflect on the Trinity in terms of these commands to love and the practices of, of love. And so I guess some of what's reflected for me in the life of the Trinity, as experienced by the early church, as reflected in the story of the gospel, as reflected in our own life together, is that this life of God is social, it's relational, it's invitational, it's hospitable. Uh, everybody's invited to join in, none are excluded. But this love is more than just hospitable. If we look at the life of Jesus. It's a, it's a serving kind of love. 
Uh, so Jesus is sometimes called the servant. Uh, he gives of himself and ultimately he gives his life for the sake of the community. In that way, it's a vulnerable sort of love as well. Jesus makes himself very vulnerable. You could say God makes God self vulnerable in uh, becoming human, living our life, sharing our pain. It's a love that is prepared to suffer and be rejected. It's a love that is self-giving. So all of that is tied up with our notion of God as reflected in the Trinity. The last part, though, that I think is really important to, to mention is that uh, if God has this amazing community uh, going on within the life of God from before creation of the world, uh, how do we relate to that? And that's what the psalm was trying to pick up. You know, what is humanity that God is even mindful of us? Um, who are these um, nobodies, if you like, that Jesus is hanging out with? The types of people that everyone else was rejecting, uh, lepers, um, prostitutes, tax collectors, all sorts of people that were the, um, the really marginalised members of, of society back then. And Jesus wanted to hang out with them. He wanted to bring this hospitable serving kind of love and inclusion to those people. And in the Gospel of John, in the descriptions of God there, we are invited to join this loving community of God. So it's expressed in terms of Jesus being in the Father, dwelling in the Father, and the Father dwelling in Jesus. But then that invitation is extended to us. So we're invited to dwell in Jesus and in God as well. So we're invited, if you like, to both enjoy the hospitality of God and be part of God's community, but we're also invited to join the dance, if you like, of the Trinity. Uh, and to enjoy that intimate relationship and communion that Jesus obviously enjoyed with God, and we see him often speaking about it and taking himself off side to pray. He says, well, that same relationship that I enjoy with God is available to you. It's open to you. And... In some ways, that's the role of the Spirit, to bring us into that relationship with God. So that's probably plenty of words from me. I'd just like to invite us all to spend a couple of minutes uh, just sitting quietly, um, praying, if that's your way of doing this, contemplating who God is for you, and what it might mean to be invited to share in the life of God, in to be part of this loving community within God, uh, this hospitable, invitational, uh, vulnerable love that is God. So let's just take a moment. <laughs> 